It would be an understatement to say that in the second half of the 20th century, the world was full of civil wars. From Greece to Korea to the Congo, nearly every corner of the world saw some form of clash with the military coup d'etat or a civil uprising, and the various governments attempted to quell it. And of course, the Cold War superpowers at the time saw these as perfect opportunities to flex on each other by supporting the side that aligned with their political agenda, often turning the conflicts into proxy wars. Normally, this is pretty straightforward, with the typical war seeing the Soviet Union send weapons and support to whatever local Marxist revolution was occurring, and the United States supporting anyone and everything that opposed communism. However, in the case of the Nigerian Civil War, the sides of the conflict would be anything but straightforward. Also known as the Biafra War, this one would turn out to be the center of one of the most convoluted international responses of all time, with the United States and the Soviet Union unbelievably supporting the same side, while countries like France and China were doing everything they could to help the opposite movement. Today we're going to dive into this bewildering foreign aid and the reasons the Nigerian civil war started in the first place. We'll explore the brutal fighting and the ethnic violence, and sadly, also the grim possibility of a continuation erupting in the pretty near future. On the 1st of October 1960, Nigeria gained independence from the United Kingdom, joining a comically long list of countries to do so in the last couple of hundred years. Officially, the country was called the Federation of Nigeria, and although it was now governed by an elected prime minister, the Queen of England was still technically the monarch. With their independence secure, the Federation of Nigeria was now Africa's most populous country with a population of over 45 million at the time. But the ethnic makeup of this 45 million is where the real complexity of the country lies, within the borders that were drawn up rather arbitrarily by their old colonial power. But the ethnic makeup of this 45 million is where the real complexity of the country lies. Within the borders drawn up rather arbitrarily by their old colonial power, there were over 300 different cultural or ethnic groups, and they were all now lumped together without regard into a single country. Politics were definitely going to be messy, but it's even worse when you understand just how different the three largest ethnic groups were. In the north of the country lived the largest ethnic group, the Hausa Fulani. This religion was dominated by Islam, and so the social and political hierarchy was controlled by local emirs, who in turn obeyed the rule of the Sultan. The Sultan was the highest authority in political, religious, and economic matters, and the Hausa Fulani were accustomed to such absolute rule. The Hausa Fulani and other groups from the north also made up the vast majority of Nigeria's military because there was a stereotype that they were stronger and tougher than the other ethnic groups. In the southwest lived the Yoruba, who had a similar system of monarchs, but here they had far less political power. Along with just having less overall authority, these monarchs, called Oba, were generally people who had earned their wealth and the respect of the community, in contrast to the House of Fulani up north, whose leaders generally inherited their status. The Yoruba were also seen as the wealthiest group, and they dominated Nigeria's capital, Lagos. In the southeast of the country, in a place known as the Niger Delta, Delta lived the Igbo, who had a very different approach compared to the other two groups. The Igbo had monarchs as well, but their position was mostly symbolic, and they didn't hold much power. Instead, matters were voted on democratically by both men and women, and both cities and villages were relatively autonomous and voted on their own laws. Oh, and Another tiny important detail, the southeast where the Igbo lived was home to Nigeria's massive oil reserves. Of course, this is an oversimplified explanation, and there were hundreds more ethnicities sprinkled throughout these areas, but these three main groups made up about 70% of their respective regions. And their differences are even further highlighted when you factor in religion, because Western missionaries had converted a huge portion of the South to Christianity, but they hadn't seen very much much success in the Muslim North. So, this is the incredibly diverse mess that was now suddenly all wrapped up into a single independent nation, and they needed to vote on matters that affected everyone. In the first two years, things seemed to get off to an okay start, but just as Nigeria began to stand up on its own legs, they began to wobble like those of a newborn goat. 
Starting just a couple of years into independence, workers began to protest low wages and poor living conditions, especially in Lagos, where the contrast with the lavish lifestyles of the wealthy was glaringly obvious. People worked long, grueling hours for low pay, only to come home to overcrowded, often dangerous housing, and they weren't going to put up with it any longer. Even outside of Lagos, new protests and riots were popping up every day, with people from almost every ethnicity joining in. This eventually led to a historic nationwide labor strike in June 1964, during which riot police had to be deployed to disperse the crowds in several cities. In the end, the workers got what they wanted most, wage increases. But the government resistance to reflect the will of the people solidified many citizens' beliefs that the politicians in charge were horribly corrupt. In 1963, there was a brief chance for some change when Nigeria switched up their government a bit when they established a federal republic and set up a new parliament. But in reality, not much changed and corruption remained rampant. The distrust and the hatred for corrupt politicians was so strong that when candidates for the 1964 elections were touring Nigeria, they were routinely attacked, and sometimes the violence was so extreme that the army was deployed to put a stop to it. The worst of this was in a central state inhabited by the Tiv people, where clashes with the army were so intense that thousands of civilians were killed or arrested in deadly street battles. Eventually, though, the 1964 elections did take place and resulted in a landslide victory for the Northern People's Congress. Congress, a political party with near unanimous support from the House of Fulani in the north. With this victory, the previous Prime Minister, Sir Abu Bakar Tafawa Balewa, was re elected. But a huge portion of the country saw this as yet another corrupt game. Violence started breaking out all over the country, and as more and more people began fleeing across the country back to their ethnic homelands, Nigeria's cultural division was as tense as it had ever been. In the north especially, Igbos were targeted, leading to as many as 30,000 of them being massacred, half of which were children. This was done openly with vast public support, and no attempts were even made to hide the killings. Anthropologist Charles Keel was present in Nigeria when this happened, and he later recalled that when he saw the corpses in the street, soldiers merely apologized for the stench and escorted him away, reassuring him that they were doing the world a favor by getting rid of the Igbo. Because of this, Igbos and other minorities at risk fled in droves to other regions of the country. But things weren't so safe there either, as the people in these regions were continuing to riot, this time accusing the re-elected prime minister of rigging the election and gaining votes through fraud and the army's intimidation. This, of course, was only possible because the majority of the men in the army were the northerners and had already proven that they wouldn't hesitate to resort to violence. However, not everyone in the army was happy with the way things were going. In January 1966, a handful of army majors had gathered support from some soldiers and launched a military coup d'etat in which they were successful in capturing nearly every important political figure in the north. The prime minister was executed along with several other important politicians, but the president conveniently happened to be on vacation at the time and because he was an Igbo from the south, many believed he had actually been tipped off about the coup ahead of time to save his life. So, the coup succeeded in the north, but in the rest of the country, their attempts to overthrow the government were halted. The heads of the Nigerian army, Johnson Aguiyaronsi, was able to crush the revolution in the south and west and was later able to capture the majors who had initiated the coup. And with the government now in shambles, Aronsi declared himself head of the state of Nigeria, suspended the constitution, and dissolved the remainder of parliament, vowing to restore order to the country. However, Aronsi had failed in one crucial part of suppressing the revolution, which was to hunt down and arrest the remaining dissenters within his army's ranks. The main leaders of the failed coup d'etat had been captured, but every man who had supported them was still an active member of the army. Failing to weed out these insurgents would soon turn out to be a fatal mistake. On a trip to Ibadan, the third largest city in Nigeria, the new head of state, Ironsi, was visiting military barracks when the army there suddenly mutinied and initiated a second coup d'etat. During this counter coup, Ironsi was captured and executed, and once again, a new leader of Nigeria was chosen. This time, it was Lieutenant Colonel Yakubu Gowan. Gowan did his best to put an end to the violence and recorded several broadcasts urging the North to stop the mass killings but to no avail. He also tried to meet with the four regional leaders of Nigeria's Supreme Military Council from the North, East, 
West and Midwest, but this was easier said than done. Gowan hoped to unite the four governors and find a way to end the country's crisis, but the general in charge of the eastern region, Ojukwu, refused to meet with the others because he feared for his life in the other states of Nigeria. Eventually, the parties were able to meet abroad in Ghana, and after long discussions and negotiations, everyone agreed on one main point. Nigeria needed to return to a federation of semi-independent states. This would hopefully allow each region to handle its own local economy, laws, and other matters, while the Nigerian military government would only handle matters that would affect the country as a whole. At the end of the meeting, Gowan and the representatives from each region signed the Aburi Accord, which detailed how this new federation would be implemented, and everyone left the meeting with a sense of optimism. And so it seemed, for a moment, there was a light shining through the clouds, and perhaps the violence and the ethnic tension would be put to rest. But these hopes were soon dashed as soon as the leaders returned to Nigeria, when Gowan released a televised broadcast announcing that he changed his mind concerning the Aburi Agreement and he would be drawing up Nigeria's new state lines as he saw fit. On the 27th of May 1967, Gowan officially divided Nigeria into 12 states and in doing so, sliced up Ajakwu's eastern region into three separate parts, the southeastern state, the river state, and the east central state. These had been done in such a crafty way that the majority of the Igbo people were now located in the East Central State, while Nigeria's oil reserves were located in the other two states, effectively cutting them off from all possible revenue. Just three days later, Ajaku responded to Gowan's new borders by announcing the independence and succession of his region, which was now officially called the Republic of Biafra. This was unacceptable to the federal military government, not only because a portion of the country was attempting to secede, but also because uh, they were taking with them the aforementioned oil reserves, and Biafra had already announced a new royalty tax on exports. Gowan responded by issuing a national decree that essentially gave them absolute power over any regional government. But the situation was already spiraling out of control, and Biafra refused to acknowledge his authority. Ajaku was well aware of the dangerous game he was playing, and after the succession, he calmly said, if civil war comes, and I do think it's imminent, it will, for us, be the price of freedom. While the government decided on their next move, they placed a complete embargo on Biafra, with the crucial exception of oil exports, as they begrudgingly still relied on them, but later they expanded the blockade to include oil when they learned that the British oil companies Shell and BP had agreed to pay the royalties to Biafra. Shell and BP were vital partners of Nigeria's economy, and along with a couple of other British firms, they made up nearly half of Nigeria's total foreign trade, exporting more than 500,000 barrels of oil every day. Losing these partnerships would cripple Nigeria's economy, and so the federal military government knew they had to act quickly before they lost Biafra and their oil forever. The war began on the 6th of July 1967 as mortar shells began striking the city of Ogoja, a city situated very close to the northern border between Bafra and Nigeria. Gowan announced that this operation was technically police action, though it was in fact the army carrying out the assault. The goal was clear, retake Biafra through any means necessary and eliminate anyone who opposed the reintegration. But Nigeria's army in 1967 wasn't exactly prepared for serious combat. Despite fighting alongside the Allies as a British colony in World War II, their current military was woefully untrained. Most of the officers had been foreigners that had long since left, and many others had been executed in army purges. They were really more of a glorified, heavily armed police force than an army, and they lacked any experience carrying out complex military operations. But their opponent was even less prepared for the conflict, despite Ajaku's confident remarks about freedom. At the onset of the war, both sides only had a few thousand men ready to fight, and not nearly enough modern firearms to go around. The Nigeria offensive, codenamed Operation Unicorn, successfully pushed through the northern border and captured several Bafran cities within the first month of fighting. Led by Colonel Mohamed Shuwa, the Nigerian army was ruthless in its advances, hoping to move quickly and capture Biafra's capital, Anugu. At the same time, a Nigerian Marine Commando division landed in a surprise attack on Biafra's southern coast, hoping to capture the oil lines and cut off the independent region from outside supply lines. This is when the Biafrans started cashing in some luck. 
First, a scout team was able to kill one of Nigeria's high-ranking majors during a nighttime surprise attack in the north, and secondly, a Chaku had come up with a clever plan to distract his enemies. This was codenamed Operation Torch, and it was intended to take advantage of the neutrality of the Midwest state next door. When the war had broken out, the Midwest had declared their neutrality, and the federal government approved this, expecting a quick end to the Biafran resistance and not expecting to need a full mobilization involving the whole country. Because of this, the federal forces were advancing only from the north and the south, leaving the west side wide open. Meeting almost no resistance, Biafran forces charged into the Midwest, capturing city after city until finally reaching the state's capital, which fell in just hours. Within a few days, a huge portion of the Midwest state had fallen to Biafran forces, and the federal army now had to divert their attention away from Biafra to defend on the new front, just as Ajoku had hoped. After regrouping for a few days, the Biafrans continued their march through the Midwest, this time aiming for Nigeria's biggest city, Lagos. But they were now too far from home to help when riots against Biafran independence started breaking out. A few ethnicities within Biafra had sided with the government and began violently protesting and raiding government buildings. At one point, they attacked a small Biafran army camp where they killed 50 soldiers and stole all of their weapons. In response, the Biafran soldiers marching through the Midwest raided small villages of the ethnicities responsible, committing atrocities that would get this video demonetized if we describe them in detail. Let that tell you enough about them. By mid-September, the entire Midwest was under Biafran control, and Ajakui declared its new name the Republic of Benin, part of Biafra. When this news reached Gowan, he removed the label of police action from the conflict and declared all-out war on Biafra. Just a day later, Nigerian divisions began attacking the western border of the newly named Republic, forcing the Biafrans to retreat from the territory they'd just captured. At the same time, the commando division that had landed in the south was redirected to the west and was able to push the Biafrans back with heavy mortar attacks and quick, decisive strikes. After just a couple of days, the entire Midwest state had been retaken by the government, who were now marching to Biafra's capital, Anugu. Federal jets began bombing the capital, and Jakwu had to plead with his army to not abandon in the city, but the aerial bombings were simply too intense, and after a few days, people began evacuating from the capital. In October, the federal forces reached the capital and bombed it with heavy artillery before marching in. They surrounded Ajaku's house, but he was able to miraculously escape by disguising himself as a servant and fleeing, saving his life. Enugu had fallen, and the federal government was certain this demoralizing defeat would mean the end of Biafran succession. But boy, were they wrong. The quick end of the war that Gowan had hoped for slipped through his fingers with Ajakwi's escape. After fleeing south, he quickly set up a new headquarters and a reformed Biafran government as he was determined to hold out against the federal army. Ethnic hatred was running so high that the federal army began raiding villages and accusing them of being Biafran supporters simply based on their ethnicity, often beating or killing anyone who was found guilty. The worst of these raids were in the village of Asaba, where dozens of men, women, and children were beaten or executed as a result of the accusations. After a day or so of being terrorized by the army, the remaining citizens gathered at the main street, dressed in traditional clothing, and began chanting phrases in support of the federal government, such as One Nigeria, the slogan of the current ruling party. The army simply stood by and watched until they received and obeyed the heartless order to open fire. When the booming of the machine guns had finished, well over a thousand innocent people had lost their lives, mostly men and boys, who had been separated from the women before the shooting started. Throughout the next few months, battles raged all along the front line between the two forces. At the city of Anitsha, federal forces made a daring charge as they crossed the river Niger in small boats, only to be repelled when Biafran reinforcements arrived and any attempts to cross the river again for a follow-up attack were unsuccessful. At the southern coastal city, Kalabar, the army was able to crush the Biafran resistance thanks to aerial and naval firepower. But instead of a full retreat, the Biafran forces fled to the outskirts of the city and began fighting a guerrilla war against the attackers. Ajaku responded to their desperate pleas for help by dispatching a unit of foreign mercenaries led by an experienced French paratrooper. But these men were also forced to retreat in the face of heavy mortar fire and air superiority, and Calabra soon fell to the government forces. By 1968, even after the battle where they suffered their highest casualties yet, the government forces had captured most of Biafra's coastline, northern and western borders, and were preparing to slowly encircle and squeeze out the seceding territory like a boa constrictor. But then a new variable entered the equation. 
foreign aid. The international community was well aware of what was happening in Nigeria at the time, and they were pretty split on how to respond. Most countries started off with a hands-off approach of sympathizing with the Biafran motive, but not really doing much else, and definitely not officially recognizing the region as a new nation. But things started to change in 1968, when footage of the war began reaching televisions all around the world, and the images were nothing short of haunting. Nigeria's blockade of Biafra had resulted in a mass food shortage, and severe hunger was widespread. Biafra claimed that Nigeria was committing genocide by starvation, and the chilling photos of thousands of Manarish children brought much of the world to support this claim. Families watching from homes in the United States were outraged, and movements to send food to Biafra began to gather serious support. But the U.S. government itself maintained its official stance of neutrality, as they claimed that it was Britain's post-colonial area of influence, and they wouldn't interfere. This neutrality, though, is usually seen as actually supporting the Nigerian side, because the State Department had millions of dollars worth of assets in Lagos and didn't want them to fall into the hands of the Biafrans. The Soviet Union was a huge supporter of Nigeria's side, largely because the USSR was very anti-secessionist. After all, they didn't want any of their own 15 Soviet socialist republics to get any ideas. The Soviet Union sold weapons, ammunition, and even a squadron of MiG-17 fighter jets along with 200 Soviet technicians to keep them in shape to the government forces. However, it turns out that the Nigerian pilots weren't trained well enough on modern aircraft, so Egypt allowed its Air Force pilots to join the war and fly for Nigeria. These pilots were eventually replaced by some from East Germany because they were better trained for the fighter jet and much more accurate with their bombing runs. The USSR's support of the Nigerian government also reflected their positions in other African conflicts, such as the Congo, where similar movements had sprung up. Britain also sided with the Nigerian government. This was mostly due to the fact that Nigeria sold a shit ton of oil to them, but also because they saw Nigerian victory as the best way to restabilize the region. Britain sent weapons, ammunition, intelligence, and even helped hire foreign mercenaries for Nigeria. Bulgaria, Saudi Arabia, and Syria were also notable supporters of the Nigerian government. Israel was also on this side, but funnily enough, only for the first half of the war. Starting in 1968, their growing distrust of the Nigerian government and its strong Muslim backbone, as well as their sympathy for the victims of the genocide in Biafra, prompted them to switch allegiances and begin funding the secessionist state. They sent hundreds of tons of food and weapons, and even a transport plane. So now, onto Biafra side. The biggest supporter was by far France. France gave aircraft, weapons, and even armored vehicles to the Biafran military. They helped them hire foreign mercenaries and sent them huge shipments of captured Axis weapons from World War II. They also promoted their cause in the international scene, becoming their loudest supporter and urging the world to recognize the genocide that was taking place. And let's not forget, Biafra also promised them a lot of oil. The support was so strong that Ajaku even suggested that Biafra have mandatory French lessons in school. Along with France, Portugal, Spain, and West Germany sent weapons along with a host of assorted African nations, and interestingly, Czechoslovakia, who did all they could for Biafra until they had to withdraw their support and focus on their own needs when the Soviet Union knocked on their door during the Warsaw Pact invasions. The last big supporter of Biafra was none other than China, mostly out of spite in their rivalry with the Soviet Union since the communist friendship between the two had soured in recent years. Basically, if the Soviets were supporting something, they were against it, and so they smuggled weapons into Biafra through Tanzania, sending well over $2 million worth of arms. Biafra was also stuffed to the brim with foreign mercenaries, many of whom developed serious emotional motivation to help the Biafran cause. Among these men was a Polish pilot, former German and Scottish soldiers, and even a Belgian mercenary who reportedly drew his motivation from his intense hatred for the British government. Aside from military support, nearly every country was sympathetic to the starvation of Biafra, but Many struggled to find ways to help. The French Red Cross were very prominent in the region, but even they were subject to brutal attacks at times. Despite the danger, they remained in the war zone and eventually founded the group that would go on to become Doctors Without Borders, as they were desperate to see the creation of a group that would provide help regardless of nationality, region, or conflict. The Catholic Church and other Christian organizations had various foundations that shipped food through neighboring countries, especially once it was learned that the Biafrans were largely Christian and various non-governmental organizations began popping up to provide relief. It was incredibly difficult to actually get the food to Biafra, though, and volunteers would often risk their lives to fly their own planes over the region and drop sacks of food and medicine. But it still wasn't enough to curb the region's hunger, and thousands were dying of malnutrition as the weeks wore on. So, this is where the two sides stood in mid-1968, both heavily armed by various foreign powers, fighting a slow, bloody war for what they believed 
was right for their country. Biafra was surrounded, but they refused to surrender, determined to fight to the last man. In late 1968, the Nigerian army began what it called the final offensive, certain that with a final decisive push, they could put an end to this insurgency once and for all. The first main objective of this operation was Port Harcourt, a sprawling riverside city that was Biafra's only remaining access to the sea. First, the Nigerian army pushed on to the city of Afam, knocking out a power station that brought electricity to much of Biafra, plunging the region into blackouts. As they continued pushing the front line north, heading for Port Harcourt, a broadcast was heard on every radio as a Jukwu rallied the Biafrans to defend the port. Gowan wants Port Harcourt. He wants our own wealth by all means and at all costs, but he cannot get it. Port Harcourt signifies our freedom. But ultimately, the Biafrans were no match for the superior firepower that had been placed in the hands of the Nigerian army. Blankets of mortar fire rained down on the army barracks and airport, and bombing runs shook the city night and day. After five days of heavy combat, despite resisting with all their might, the Biafrans were forced out of the city, and Port Harcourt had fallen. This was a demoralizing loss, and many Biafrans were losing hope that a victory would ever be possible. The Nigerians ruthlessly continued inland throughout 1969, capturing city after city and shaking off Biafran counterattacks. Eventually, Biafra was only a fraction of its former size, and a clever Nigerian attack split the remaining land in half. Finally, in early 1917, the Nigerians initiated Operation Tailwind, attacking the north and south halves of the remaining Biafra territory simultaneously and successfully capturing all remaining cities. The Jaku was forced to flee, ending up in exile in the Ivory Coast, and Biafra officially surrendered two days later. Nigeria was finally reunited, but at what cost? Deaths from combat were quite high, with as many as 100,000 men being killed during the two and a half years of fighting. But the civilian numbers jaw-dropping. An estimated two million Biafrans died of starvation during the blockade, half of which were children. Those who managed to survive were subject to permanent damage from the months of severe malnutrition, including reduced height and strength, fertility issues, as well as extreme poverty that plagued the post-war region for years. This poverty was made worse by the fact that Nigeria changed its currency near the end of the war, so any reserves of old currency held by Biafrans were useless once the country was reunited. For decades, the Igbo people and others in the region accused the government of failing to provide funds to reconstruct the destroyed region, and further political and ethnic tensions remained over who would control the lucrative oil fields and exports. Igbo people routinely had their houses stolen from them by wealthier families following the conflict, with the government refusing to help, leaving many once stable families homeless, alongside hundreds of thousands of refugees that had fled during the massacres preceding the war. These tensions ebbed and flowed for decades. But just recently, they've taken a new turn. In 2012, a new separatist movement was announced. The Indigenous People of Biafra, a determined political group vowing to restore Biafra's independence. In 2021, a paramilitary wing of this new group raided a farm, killing the livestock and raising the fields as a punishment for disobeying orders. The Nigerian army was deployed, and the fighting between the two left over a hundred people dead. Today, there are active separatists in almost every region of what was once Biafra, and their violent clashes with both security forces and civilians of targeted ethnicities are becoming more and more commonplace. The future of the region is unstable, as saying the least. It's unclear whether or not a full-scale conflict will erupt once again. But the possibility isn't off the table, especially with the separatists having already announced that the second Biafran war has begun, with the claim being that this time around, Biafra is going to win. <laughs>